Hello, everyone. Uh, let me just start by saying that this presentation may contain forward-looking statements. Please refer to the accompanying slides for more information. Welcome to this, to this session titled Why Tech Matters and part of Octane 20 Live. My name is Erin Baudo Felter, and it is my privilege to lead Okta for Good and serve as Okta's Vice President for Social Impact. Now, many of you may have just watched our keynote session in which I announced uh, Okta for Good's new three-year philanthropy commitment. And for those of you who are just joining us now, I'll briefly share that news again. Today, Okta committed $10 million in funding over the next three years out of the Okta for Good Fund. The centerpiece of this new effort is our new nonprofit technology initiative, which aims to support a paradigm shift in how we support, fund, and as a part of that announcement, we also announced seven major grants to organizations working at the intersection of technology and social good. And a fun coincidence, actually, today is also the public launch of one of our new grantees. It's a nonprofit called Tech Matters, and the founder is here with me today, Jim Fruchterman. Hey, Aaron, I'm delighted to be here at Octane 20 to talk about technology for social good. Awesome, great to have you, Jim. Now, a quick reminder before we get started, this session was actually pre-recorded, but both Jim and I are currently live in the chat box on your screen. So please drop us your questions and comments there and we'll be happy to respond. Now, before we get into this, let me also tell you a little bit more about Jim. Jim is one of the world's most experienced social entrepreneurs, and he exclusively focuses on applying technology to social problems. After founding two very successful Silicon Valley machine learning companies in the 80s, he started an organization called Benetech, which is one of the Valley's top tech for good nonprofits. While leading Benetech for 30 years, he launched numerous successful social enterprises and has won many awards, including the MacArthur Fellowship, the Skoll Award for Social Entrepreneurship, Caltech's Distinguished Alumni Award, and the Schwab Fellowship. He's just also one of my absolute favorite people in this space and a great new friend. And I think that you'll see by the end of this conversation why Okta for Good is so enthusiastically investing in Jim and Tech Matters. So Jim, welcome to Octane 20, and let's start. Please tell us why tech matters. Well, tech matters because of what it can do for the planet and all of humanity, not just the richest 5%. You know, the tech industry, we're very proud of what we've created, how technology can make so many parts of life better. And just about every social problem we're seeing today can benefit from technology being applied smarter. The best way to scale up giant innovations is to use technology to help you get there. But I think we have to tackle, why do the benefits of technology actually not reach everybody? And the power to do good with technology matters so much to me that I think it's a great reason to start a nonprofit. And that's why I've named the new nonprofit Tech Matters, and it's at techmatters.org. And we wanna see the benefits of technology reach more people to make technology really matter for more people. And Jim, tell me, what drew you into Tech for Good in the first place? How did it start? Well, my Tech for Good story started at a board meeting over 30 years ago in Silicon Valley. Everyone sitting around the table um, had invested at least a million dollars in my startup, and I was there to show them a new product. You see, we'd, we'd invented, using machine learning, some really cool character recognition technology that could read just about any font, any machine printed font. And, you know, we were making our money by selling it to insurance companies and government agencies and lawyers to scan things. But the really cool application of this was that it could read to the blind. So I, I gave a demo, I had a piece of paper and it you know, went through the scanner and then our secret sauce was you know, something that would crunch the image into a text file. And then we sent it to a first generation voice synthesizer in a PC. And you know, the voice said, you know, these are the times that try men's souls. But it wasn't quite that natural sounding. And then one of our investors said, wow, Jim, the demo worked. You're the VP of marketing. How big is the market for reading machines to the blind? And I said, well, our best numbers are about $1 million per year. Thud. <laughs> and finally, after an awkward silence, one of our investors said, and what exactly is the connection to the $25 million that we've collectively invested in this startup? 
I've been trying to answer that question ever since. <laughs> I mean, the challenge is so many things that make a lot of sense in terms of social impact don't pencil out when it comes to making the giant profits that tech startups have to make. We had promised to make our donors a lot of money and they vetoed the product on the spot because, you know, that wasn't on the direct path. We weren't yet making enough money. So, and, you know, I, I've struggled with how would you do with this? Well, my lawyer said, well, why don't you start a deliberately nonprofit tech company? And I, I kind of giggled because, of course, all the startups I'd ever worked for were accidentally nonprofit. <laughs> they just didn't set out to be nonprofit. Um, but, uh, but in the nonprofit sector, it turns out that a million dollar a year break even social enterprise is a giant success. So by setting out to be deliberately nonprofit, we're almost successful from definition. The goalposts have moved way over and we can do a lot of social good if we're trying to maximize the amount of social good while breaking even instead of maximizing profits. Awesome, awesome. Now, now your new work with new work tech matters. Tech matters. So we want the benefits of technology to reach everybody. So why doesn't tech reach more people today? Well, I think, and I know that's a very unpopular thing because right? everyone thinks the market will solve all problems, but it doesn't. That's why we have a social sector, right? Is, is to plug that gap when no one can make enough money off of it. And, you know, my data point with, with my first successful startup is just one, but it's a pretty pervasive question. When you have an idea for a new product or innovation, and it doesn't pencil out, it doesn't make enough money, everyone in the, in the tech community tells you it's a bad idea. You should put it on the shelf. And I don't agree with that. And I think a lot of tech people don't agree with that. There are really exciting opportunities to apply tech for social good. So, you know, that's part of my goal in starting Tech Matters is to talk to people about these other ways to use technology to do social good. And, and even though you're just announcing Tech Matters, literally today, uh, but you've also been, you've, you've already been working on it for more than a year. So what does Tech Matters actually do? Well, you know, our mission is to bring the benefits of technology to all of humanity, not just the richest 5%. And, you know, we do basically several different things. I'd say pretty much expert advising uh, and then launching new technology for social good enterprises. So on the advising part, um, we act as the nerd advisor, the chief technology officer, the CTO that most nonprofits, most foundations, and most policymakers don't actually have. So I call it CTO for an hour. Um, now, it turns out that uh, it's actually more like anti-consulting because the number one thing I do is I talk people out of bad ideas, right? Uh, and I mean, I've collected a whole bunch. We'll talk about them. But, um, but you know, after someone comes to me and says, oh, someone told me I should do X. I'm like, no, or Salesforce is free. I'm like, well, not exactly. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about what total cost of ownership, things like that, things that tech people know to talk about. Um, I say, what are you actually trying to do? And, you know, so often someone is is coming up with a, with a need that's already been well met by somebody else, um, you know, but because the nonprofit sector doesn't have a lot of money, we don't have a lot of marketing dollars. So the tech people in the nonprofit sector don't have the money to spread the word about their solutions, even if they happen to be a for-profit, you know, trying to eke out a living working with the nonprofit sector. And, you know, the uh, it may be that someone has solved the problem in an adjacent field, but you never talk to people in the adjacent field about their tech solutions. So I play that role of kind of connecting the dots because I've seen hundreds of mostly failed projects and dozens of successful ones. And, you know, under the hood, Nonprofits are really a lot alike. So, you know, I think, I think, um, and of course we do this, you know, because that's our mission. As a nonprofit, we can afford to give away an hour of free consulting or even more if we need to, to do something really important. But we're looking for big opportunities. Where is there a giant gaping hole where if this was golf courses or restaurants, you know, there'd be 50 companies building software for it because it's the nonprofit sector, you know, they're, they're handing around an Excel spreadsheet. I want to build that platform. I want to be that standards and glue software play that is so often in the tech sector what people actually take advantage of. And so that's where market failure really hits. And, uh, and you know, thanks to, thanks to just spending the last 15 months talking to a whole bunch of people, we've already come up with two of those systems change opportunities. 
Yeah, that's great. And I want to get into this now and, and have you give us a deeper dive into what are those opportunities you've identified? What do these projects look like? And, and bring that to life for us a bit. Well, cool. Because I've been, you know, the one nerd in the room with nonprofit leaders for 30 years, everyone brings me their technology sins and woes, right? I mean, I come kind of like father confessor to the field. And, uh, and so, and so people kind of know, so I had um, one of the best serial social entrepreneurs in the world, Jeru Bilamoria, started Child Helpline in India over 20 years ago, Child Finance International, all these different, she starts everything, right? And she came to me oh, a year and a half ago and said, um, hey, I've got this, uh, um, this, this strategic plan that a very famous consulting company has come, come up with me. And, and, and half of their deck talked about an app, an app that no one would download. And I, I looked at it and said, you don't have an app use case. What are you really trying to do? And it turned out that she, you know, represented the child helpline movement. These are pretty much 911 for kids in most countries. Most, most have a three digit emergency software, you know, I mean, emergency telephone number that you call. And if you see a kid in trouble, you just, you just reach out to these people and they find a solution for you. And so, um, I, thanks to Drew saying that, you know, I should actually look at them. Guess what? They're 10 or 15 years behind the times of their technology. I talked to, 25 national child helplines out of the 175 that are in the child helpline international movement that Drew founded. Um, they all rolled their own technology. They're all running a contact center, but they all did something that was either custom or heavily semi-custom. And we can come back to all the problems with doing something as custom, right? That's, that's not very sustainable. But, um, anyway, uh, they collectively take 30 million phone calls a year. This is a $250 million a year field and they're answering seven or 8 million out of the 30 phone calls a year. That's a lot of kids that aren't getting served that are trying to reach out, you know, that gave up after waiting on hold for 30 or 40 minutes. And the for-profit industry has solved these problems, right? We, we know how to run a modern contact center. We know that voice isn't the only way to do it. 95% of, of the contacts that the helpline movement have are still voice calls. Now, anyone who knows a teenager knows that they're just a little bit more like use text than voice. And so, so what we're doing is, uh, and, and this is kind of our standard, you know, the standard Silicon Valley playbook that we all know really well. You interview a bunch of people, you say, what are you doing? How is technology helping? Where is technology getting in the way? What would be a miracle if technology can make it, you know, do something for your mission to help the kids in this case that they serve and people tell us. And, and then, you know, we say things like, uh, you know, have you ever heard of Twilio? And they go, no. And we, well, we have. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so, you know, we, we, we got, you know, funded by, you know, Twilio and Facebook and Schmidt Futures, you know, Eric Schmidt's new film to, to actually go out and build an open source common cloud platform that supports all these different channels. And the goal is how can we help the helpline movement answer three times more calls and contacts, more texts, without actually greatly increasing their, their human capital, without having to, to, to grow their budgets much, right? And that's what technology can do. And I don't have to share with you all the techniques that, that we would apply to someone who's using a more traditional telephone contact center. Everyone, everyone who's probably in this audience knows the 10 things you might try. And believe me, we're trying them. And, and I'm betting that most of them will work really well. So, so that's the idea is that, you know, We'll probably end up with a one or two million dollar a year break even social enterprise that is the back end for dozens of national helplines that help them do a far better job for kids that meet them where they are and actually, you know, see that they get the solution to their problem, whether it's, you know, hunger or abuse or sexual violence or, you know, all the terrible things that happen to kids. And, you know, we won't actually be doing that but we'll be building the tools that make those people more powerful. That's what tech for good is all about. Absolutely. That's awesome. That's so, so inspiring and so clear. Well, how we can port over, yeah, how we can, you know, port over how we work and how we do things in our industry and, and make an impact in such an obvious, clear way. Now tell me about the other project that you're working on, because that's in a different space. Yeah. And, and this project is, you know, almost a year behind the other one. I mean, the, the Child Helpline Project, you know, we're about to release version four. Um, it's going to go live by the end of the year in at least one country and next year in you know, a handful of countries. The Thousand Landscapes for One Billion People project uh, is we just started interviewing potential users in November. So so about 11 months behind. But 
Uh, and you can tell from the title, um, A Billion People, uh, it's a pretty ambitious project. And it was, again, something similar. A great, in this case, another female social entrepreneur who had the trust relationship with many of the other organizations in her field brought a group of, in this case, the major NGOs in conservation together to say, hey, you know, we're not hitting Paris. We're not hitting the sustainable development goals. We have to really shake up the way that we do things. And we have to aim not at international organizations like the UN so much, even though the UN is part of this. Uh, it's not is aiming for national governments. It's how do we bring something amazing to the local leaders, the people who actually make a lot of decisions on the ground about land use and farming and forestry and protecting wildlife and all the things that the environmental movement care, cares about. So, so the, the coalition that she brought together uh, is um, Rainforest Alliance, World Wildlife Fund, Conservation International, Common Land, which is a big Dutch environmental NGO, uh, let's see. Oh, uh, us, Tech Matters, um, Conservation. I said Conservation International. I know. I'll, I'll, I'll remember more of the list. Oh, uh, UNDP, um, the largest aid agency on the planet. Um, and then EcoAg Partners, uh, Sarah Share was the catalyst that brought this together. So um, we're we've been talking to local leaders in Africa and Asia, Central and Latin America, and we asked those same questions. You know, how is technology helping? What technologies are you actually using? What what you know is getting in the way um and man when when you show up and say hi i'm here from silicon valley i'm actually going to shut up and listen to you about what you really want to say to silicon valley about tech they tell you and so you know i heard about data colonialism you know i here i am trying to make these decisions but i don't have any of the data that you know the the, gov the national government has or that the universities have or the tech companies have um, I, uh, I want to have better comms tools to reach out to farmers, to educate them about climate smart agriculture, how they can make more money and use less water, which frankly is the majority of what this project is about. And so the same kind of goal, how do we build something that's open source, you know, and, and that implies a lot of really cool things, even though open source, as we all know, is quite business friendly, but it implies shared governance. It share, it, it implies we're not controlling their data. We don't we don't claim their data. We're here to build them great tools. And the other thing that's really key is that we're not only helping them understand where their landscape is and what business as usual would look like and why that's not good. Um, but we're also helping them come up with an action plan, an action plan that all the key stakeholders in that landscape, in that region, in that county, in that province, in that state, in that ecosystem, in that river basin, that they can agree on and say, for our sakes and for the sakes of our kids, we want a more sustainable economy and we're gonna protect our wetlands. We're gonna, we're gonna shift some of the crops that we grow. We're going to enact a law that says you can't plant palm oil on hillsides and destroy the watershed for the big city in our area. Whatever those things are, and then we'll help them find the money for it. And so, and I think that that landscape finance part that, you know, and that finance could be, it could be, uh, you know, a grant from the government or from a nonprofit. It could be uh, a loan that has a partial guarantee, a hybrid kind of structure. Um, it, it, it could be just a great for-profit investment. Um, and we just need to get the word out because there's an awful lot of investors looking for impact investing deals that actually make them some money and help the planet. So anyway, that's where that's where we're going. And so, um, you know, we, uh, we expect to start developing software in the second half of the year and starting to deploy some of those tools in 2021 all with the idea of how are we going to help local leaders, you know, find the money and find the plans that can help them build a better planet for the 2030 sustainable development goals and getting more carbon out of the, out of the economy. That's great. Um, there's so much in there that I love. And in particular, something you said, you said, it's amazing when you show up and say you're from Silicon Valley and then you shut up and listen and you let the people doing the work tell you what they're experiencing and what their needs are. Um, I could not have said that better myself. I think it's something that you and your organizations have done so excellently. And, um, and you know, we're excited to sort of learn from as we embark on our journey together with, with Tech Matters and Octa for Good. Well, and, and, and Aaron, you know, if you're a startup entrepreneur, you know, the sacred 
promise that you make with Y Combinator or whoever, you know, is you're going to go and you're going to listen to your customers. You're going to, you're going to implement a learning system. I mean, we, we worship at the altar now of, you know, let's use data to actually learn what people really want and what's working and pivot to what is working instead of the thing that isn't working. Why, when people go in the nonprofit sector, do we forget all that? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, so tell us what's next. What's coming up? What's on the horizon? Well, um, so, so my team kind of said, Hey, Jim, you've bitten off a lot. Maybe, maybe these two big projects are a good start. So, so what, what I'm focusing on this year is making these two big projects successful and working on helping build the larger tech for good field. You know, it's, I get asked for a lot of advice. Um, I need to write and communicate a lot more. I need to share a lot of these things. I need to tell a lot of stories about other people, about how they're using tech for good. Because often I can tell someone else's story far more pithily than they can, maybe not 100% as accurate, but really in a compelling way. And so I feel the need to do that. So we'll, we'll get these enterprises going. And I'm really excited, obviously, that, that Okta is backing us to work on this field building project to actually get tech for good to a much broader audience. Yeah, we're very, very excited about that too. Um, so let's go back to something, another thing you said earlier that is, is, is um, intriguing, this notion of anti-consulting and that being mm -hmm. a service that, that you and that Tech Matters can provide to nonprofit leaders. What is that? Well, I tell you, if I was a for-profit consulting company, I couldn't afford to do this. But because I'm a nonprofit with a good, good mission, I can. I mean, so many times, I mean, nonprofit leaders don't tend to be technical. I mean, we just, I mean, that's just a demographic fact. And so they're often finding themselves advised by technical people or by management consultants like, like my friend Giroux, or, um, or, you know, they built something internally to solve a need and they find themselves really confused about what they're doing and they don't, they don't know how to evaluate those things. So, you know, I, I mean, I'll start off. There are four or five dumb ideas that everybody comes up with first and I have to talk them out of, you know, like the app that no one will download, um, uh, blockchain as your first database project. I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, uh, making, making the one true list, making a big list. I mean, everyone's like, you know, let's, let's make a list of like, gee, you know, Yahoo did that once and Google kicked their butt. Maybe a list is not the best way to help people find things unless you really have all the information. So, I mean, it's not that these things don't work all the time. They just work a few percent of the time. And I can help people say, are you actually in that 5% or that 1% that actually is going to work and not the 95 or more that's not going to work? Um, and, you know, I'm not doing this just to kind of be mean. I mean, I'm doing that because I'm gathering intelligence about about what people are actually trying to do and what and often what cool things people have actually created. I'm almost never creating anything new. I'm a giant plagiarizer, but you know, so so is a lot of the tech industry, right? We see something over there and we apply it over here, right? That's that, that's a tried and true way to do a great startup. Uh, I've done it a few times, uh, but um, you know, we're looking for those gaps where we can do a systems change kind of opportunity, and that's so you know. But um, and of course, our goal. I mean, there's a lot of room for consulting. There's a lot of room for, for, for services. There's a lot of room for standard IT services that the tech sector still needs. But we think our particular niche is finding, you know, that, that platform that thousands of nonprofits would use, that tens of millions of people would benefit from, and it doesn't look like anyone who's building it. Gather the field around, you know, get critical mass of the big leaders in that field and say, let's work together and make that happen. And so, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty exciting thing. That's great. That's great. So I feel like you've touched on this in a few places, but let's get really into the biggest challenges that you see for the tech for good field. Well, I can touch on some of the patterns that I see, right? I mean, uh, first of all, there's the time machine. I've kind of alluded to it. Uh, I step into a nonprofit. I mean, after COVID-19 goes away, I'll go back to stepping into nonprofits. But, but I step in there. I can, I can tell you it's 10, 15, or 20 years behind the times, right? I mean, when I started talking to child helpline movements, I heard on-prem PBX for the first time in at least a decade, right? So, you know, I mean, and so, and it's not that these people are doing it for, for bad reasons. It's, it's because it's, it's the way the nonprofit sector works. They're on a shoestring. When you build custom products, you know, and you're the only person paying for new upgrades, there's an awful lot of things that you can't afford to pay for that if you're one of 10,000 nonprofits that all want the same thing, the people making that platform would be able to pay for, right? Um, the cult of the custom. No, you are not, as a million dollar a year nonprofit, 
unlike everybody else. It's just not the case. You know, I mean, you really should have something that starts 95% of the way. No restaurant, you know, goes out and says, oh, first thing I do is write software. <laughs> Like they don't do that. They work on having great food or having great service or having a concept and they execute on that and they just expect the tech to be the plumbing that works, that, that, that doesn't fall apart so they can go off and do what their secret sauce is that's really great. And so, and I could just, I could talk all day about the problems of trying to build a custom solution. That's the way tech used to work when I started in the tech field over 30 years ago. Every corporation had an IT department building their payroll software and their customer, you know, their customer you CRM software. No one does that anymore. Um, well, we've got to talk about talent. Um, there's a lack of especially strategic tech talent. Sometimes that's because it's just not there. And sometimes it's because it's not taken seriously. You know, I know there's a lot of great tech people who are like put off in this sort of supporting role and told your job is to make sure that, you know, that, that, that the internet stays on and that, you know, our office productivity suite operates. But the real, the real sweet spot for tech is when it becomes integrated in with program. That's, that's what a technology empowered nonprofit looks like, you know, and that's, that's where you can do amazing things. We'll come back to that. But I just, I just think that that is, that is the sweet spot. So we have to get more tech people into the field and we have to give them that kind of strategic power that's implied when a company has a, a CTO or a CIO. When there's someone where people think that information and data and technology is so important that it has to be a member of the senior management team rather than being you know, a manager that's over here in facilities or something like that, which happens at a lot of nonprofits, right? And, oh, I mean, there's just so many things, right? Uh, negative attitudes towards technology. Um, you know, it doesn't work, it's too expensive, you know, and that's both the tech and the people. I mean, the tech could be like almost cheap, you know, a tenth of what you pay if you are for profit, and the tech people could be working for half of what they could be making, and it's still too expensive. Oh man, we have to talk about that one. I, the, the idea that it all should be free. I mean, no, I mean, frankly, you should be spending 5% of your budget on tech, because I'll tell you, it's the thing that's gonna make three times more impact of everything else. It's gonna make everything else count more. Um, so I wanna help the entire technology for good field. The, the nonprofit sector, government agencies, all the people who work on social impact, counter those negative memes. Help nonprofit leaders and donors, the donors that fund them, understand why ignoring the strategic impact on technology is letting their mission down, is letting down the communities that they serve. You know, and of course, I won't frame it so much on the negative side, I'll frame it more on the positive side, but, um, you know, we have to, you know, we have to talk more about why the five dumb ideas don't work and maybe about why the five best ideas are usually pretty smart. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah, that's great. That's, that's great. I know, I know to, 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 you know, you know, we always say, you know, we always say, company is becoming a technology company and nonprofits are no different. We really see this. I mean, we've been having these conversations now for years inside of the organizations we work with and with our partner um, companies who are thinking about tech for good. We really see this as a conversation that has to change first and foremost inside of these organizations and their leadership. Yeah, I've, I've been telling, you know, major funders like Skoll and MacArthur that when they pick nonprofit fellows for their, you know, their prestigious programs, more and more of the nonprofit innovators are going to pick are basically going to be technology companies masquerading as X, right? I mean, Kiva, it's a software company doing microcredit and Callisto, where I'm on the board, is helping, you know, change the power dynamic for sexual assault survivors. But, you know, at the core, it's also a software company, just like Airbnb or Lyft. Yeah, I love that. I love that framing. So we're going to be supporting some of your work this year to start to, as you say, counter the negative memes. You talked mm -hmm. about the five dumb ideas. Mm -hmm. What are your favorite five smart ideas? Well, I'm still working on that list, but but some of them come immediately off the top of my head, right? So, you know, I mean, do agile, do ro rapid prototyping, do learning, do lean. Um, I mean, tech should almost always be built to actually learn rather than enforce a rigid framework uh, that's almost certainly wrong. <laughs> you know, I mean, ideas about how the world works and how humans work could actually be better informed by data that we can now affordably get and actually apply to learning. Um, 
I've already alluded to build shared platforms that solve the problem of thousands of nonprofits. There's tons of those opportunities, far more than I could ever tackle. Um, and, you know, create standards, both process standards and data standards. Standards remove the friction in the field. At the center of every new exciting tech industry is a standards body or three, you know, a group of people writing open source glue code or building standards to actually, you know, raise the stack up so that you're actually much further along towards that. And, you know, that actually means you need to be building on top of a modern tech stack. I mean, do not try to re-implement security. Do not try to redo telecom. You know, don't, don't reinvent search. <laughs> Those things have already been done well and they are available to you for almost nothing. You should actually go there and start 95, if, even if you're building a platform that you're actually doing for the nonprofit sector, you should start with a tech stack that's 95% of the way done. Most nonprofits start with a custom solution that's 50 or 60% of the way done. And we know that when you build that other 40%, it breaks. It doesn't work so well. Ah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. You know, this idea of, of shared platforms and solutions is, is definitely something we've been thinking a lot uh, about too at Okta, your la you know your last point about the the fifty to sixty percent being being built versus the ninety five that should be built, it seems so obvious, and we know the tech is there. So you know, to me, this all feels like great places for tech companies to step in and help in ways that are actually helpful. Okay, so what can for profit tech companies? like Okta, like all of our friends do to see, you know, more technology being used in the right ways for these organizations? Well, you know, I mean, market failure is real, but I see a lot of companies that are sort of like wiggling their way out of that straitjacket say, no, wait a minute, the marginal cost to actually deliver this to our profit sector is almost nothing. It's a market we might not even go after. So, so I think that a lot of companies are actually taking this much more seriously. And I think it's, you know, it's whether it's the inspiration of the founders to say sign up for something like Pledge One Percent. I mean, which, which I should talk about. So, you know, I mean, and I know Okta is is one of those Pledge One Percent companies. Many of the Impact Cloud companies are as well. You know, where you pledge one percent of your equity, one percent of your profits, one percent of your employee time, one percent of your product to social good. That's that's turning out to have a big impact, right? And 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 that is something that that people are actually telling their investors. This is part of who we are. So don't don't worry about it. You know, we're we're taking the hit for a lot of this and you should come along with us. And so so, you know, obviously the tech companies have the expertise and and they're and they're they're still, you know, we're this is still a game in process. Right. But I think a lot of people are actually working harder on trying to figure out how to actually help companies do I mean, nonprofit organizations do the right thing and actually take advantage of the expertise that companies have. Um, I mean, man, the power of intellectual property. This leverage that we get, you create it for something, you sell it to the for-profit world, and then you license it or or make a very concessionary cloud deal with the nonprofit sector. That is that is has amazing impact. And you know when I, you know I mean I come from that world, so I know how to talk the language. But when I go to a tech company and I say I want your crown jewels, I want a free license to your intellectual property worldwide for this social impact thing, they say yes eighty percent of the time. And people outside of tech are really surprised because they think tech people are so damn greedy, right? And I'm like, no, they're really proud of what they've created. And when they figure out that they're not going to make enough money by taking this technology to Zambia or to the environmental movement or to human rights, they're often really happy to see it actually benefit that way. And the people inside tech companies, man, that, that might be the thing that represents, you know, 0.1% of the revenue but might be one of the three things that they're proudest that their technology does. So I think there's a huge intellectual property opportunity. Um, the last one I'm going to talk about is volunteerism, um, you know, which, and I think we're, we're trying to get better at volunteerism. I mean, the first wave of tech volunteerism, which was the hackathon for good, you know, we're going to, we're going to invent something in a weekend. It's going to save the entire nonprofit sector. Uh, it doesn't work in the for-profit sector that way so well. And it doesn't work in the nonprofit sector either. Uh, I mean, hackathons are great for, you know, prototyping a concept or something. And people have people have gotten better at that. But, you know, the gulf right now between the average person in a tech company and the average nonprofit programmatic leader who's trying to actually save the world is pretty darn big. And we have to find ways to bridge those people so that the sophistication that the nonprofit person has about the social problem they're tackling and the sophistication that the tech person has about how to apply technology to greatly increase whatever you want to greatly increase, um, 
we have to, we have to build more of those bridges, and that's you know, and that's that's also part of our human capital challenge. Yes, I completely agree, and we see that all the time. You know, when when we look at you know nonprofits in Octa's orbit who have technical challenges or, or need support, whether it's with Octa or something else, and the you know really really talented tech experts uh, and talent inside of our company that are just raising their hands and saying, let me help. What can I do? How can I use my skills for good? And so it's not for a lack of desire, but the translation part between that is so challenging and it, it requires time and investment and its own sort of special expertise in and of itself. Right. Uh, and, and that's a big reason, at least from our perspective, why are you know Octa for Good's philanthropy efforts have taken such a strong stance on really investing in bridge builders, as you call them? We call it all you know investing in ecosystems or investing in networks, but really making investments in the the unique expertise that's going to bridge these two sectors when it comes to technology, when it comes to talent, when it comes to uh, even how we talk about these things. It's really really uh, important to do. So you know I think we're very much on the same page there and and one of the things that's been really interesting as i've looked at this you know for the last several years uh, very closely it and and that has frustrated me is that a lot of traditional philanthropic funders number one don't see that deeper value and the necessity of investing in these sort of bridge building uh intermediary organizations and number two they still don't understand tech and they don't want to fund it, uh, fund tech. They don't want to fund foundational infrastructure for nonprofits. They really still see it as overhead, uh, and they don't see it as mission serving. Even though we all know that's certainly not the case, and you've illuminated many examples of, of why that's not the case. So this is something clearly we care a lot about. What can we all do to help change the way traditional philanthropists fund philanthropists? Excuse me, fund nonprofit tech. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think those are more the negative memes that we have to counter, right? Tech is overhead. That's a negative meme, right? Tech is not program. It's something else is another negative meme that we have to tackle. We have to make philanthropists understand that technology is essential to accomplishing the outcomes that they want to see in the world. Philanthropists are giving away money because they want to see the world be better. And, you know, and we have to say, look, do you want the world to be better? Do you want to know that the world's better? I can't imagine how you're going to know whether or not this program actually works unless you actually have some tech to collect the data. And, and frankly, it, and, and we need to move away from this idea that the tech is something like this thing you do at the end, right? You need to instrument programs so they collect the data so you actually know they work. And you want to have the person who's running that program, you know, I would love that she would have the dashboard that tells her if her team is actually doing a great job or not and do course corrections real time instead of at the end of a three-year grant and say, well, we spent the money. Oh, maybe we could learn something now. No, it doesn't work that way. And so, and then the last piece is, you know, this is how you get more bang for your buck. I mean, philanthropists are always trying to figure out how can we make a bigger social impact with the relatively fixed amount of money they have. Uh, can, can you imagine any other way to get three times more social good per dollar spent or five times or 10 times or more? Any other way than actually applying tech? I, I haven't run into it very often. Yeah. So let's turn a little bit now. I want you to give some advice to the nonprofit leaders that may be watching and listening right now. We've talked to tech companies a bit. We've talked to funders a bit. Let's talk to nonprofits who are living in this, right? So so we all know that the term digital transformation is, is a buzzword. Um, but we, you know, the reality is we are working with a lot of nonprofits whose programs are fundamentally changing, whose organizations have to fundamentally change. So how might nonprofits assess whether and how their programs should be evolving around technology? What advice do you have for them? Well, you see, here's, this is the funny thing is so much of what the nonprofit sector does is about information. You know, it's about teaching people things, disseminating information. It's about education, health, economic development, environment. Those are all fields where most of what nonprofits do are about pushing information around. You know, heck, the entire field of civil rights and human rights it's all only about information. That's all they've got, plus the human activists, right? So anytime information is a key part of what you deliver, I'm guessing there's an opportunity for digital to have digital transformation, if you want to call it that, you know, to have an amazing impact on their program. And so, you know, and, you know, and even things that we think of as not being information-based, like delivering bags of rice to refugees, I mean, getting better at logistics and triage. That's why groups like NetHope, you know, and, and the World Food Program invest so much money in connectivity and data collection and, and, and getting 
getting things to the people who need it most, that's an information challenge. Absolutely. So you mentioned, sorry, there's a very loud airplane flying over my head. I hope not, I hope only I can hear it. Um, you mentioned earlier our friends in the Impact Cloud Coalition. This is a, a coalition of technology companies that are uh, committed to helping solve social problems through their technology, through their people, through their dollars. Uh, very much modeled after that pledge 1% type of uh, framework. So this is a group we're, we're very involved with, with and um, you know, have seen a lot of really exciting radical collaboration, certainly on the tech side, when you think about, you know, once a week I get on the phone with my counterparts at, at Box and at Twilio and at Salesforce and at Tableau and at DocuSign. And we all get together and we really try and think about like, what can we do? What can we not replicate, right? What can we, how can we build our stack as companies who are all working in cloud, who are all working in tech, who all care about helping nonprofits use what we have to do better. Um, how might we imagine radical collaboration like that uh, among, a, you know, among a group of 10 or 15 tech companies? Like talk to us now and tell us, what do you want to see from, from a group like that? Well, I mean, obviously the Impact Cloud crowd, you know, goes from infrastructure players like Splunk all the way to giants like, you know, Salesforce, Google, and I don't know, uh, what, is it? Uh, what the heck? Oracle, Oracle, that's a giant, <laughs> you know? And so it's easy, it's not so easy to come up with a single idea, but I mean, obviously the product donation programs are make a huge impact to get, you know, to lower the barrier to people adopting things. But I'd like to see more work done on making volunteerism more effective. I think that's an opportunity to do much better and, and people are innovating in that area. Um, but the one that's really, really made me think, you know, with COVID-19, I mean, we're at least nine months away from having this contact center going. And people are saying, can you set it up for COVID-19? And they're going, no, but two years from now, we'd, we'd be able to set it up in, you know, two hours. And so I think, I think the idea that you know, we should have some of these open source platforms that are built on top of the great cloud infrastructure that impact cloud companies have and where you can turn it on and have it be working in an hour or a day and, and actually starting to work in the case of a, a, a you know, a, a, a natural disaster or some other crisis like, like the one we're experiencing right now. And, you know, and frankly, you know, get it going and figure out how to pay for it in a month or two. Because I'll tell you, unless it's amazingly successful, the money won't be that much, right? It certainly won't be that much on day two. And so, uh, so you know, and then of course, you know, we're the beneficiary of a lot of funding from tech companies. And actually tech companies are actually more friendly to funding tech infrastructure than traditional philanthropists, as you've identified. And so, you know, obviously we've gotten money from a lot of the impact cloud groups to actually build this kind of shared infrastructure. And we really appreciate it and are looking forward to you guys funding more of our peers as we go off and do a lot more of this collectively, because it's going to take a collective to make this kind of impact. Yep, absolutely. That's great. Well, Jim, thank you so much for spending the time here uh, today with our Octane 20 live community doing a virtual fireside chat with me, which is always new and exciting. Um, do you have any final comments, final thoughts on system change and why, why tech matters? Well, you know, our collective problems are just way too big to solve by using business as usual. And the only thing that can actually make large scale systems change, you know, with the amount of money that we actually have available is using technology to be three, five, 10 X smarter about how we do things. And, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. That that old Gibson quote is so applicable to the nonprofit sector. There's so many things that have already been figured out in tech and industry that just need to reach, you know, the other 95% of humanity. And so, and I think the tech companies are up for it. I think the nonprofit sector is increasingly up for it, and I hope we can. And, you know, I can't imagine a more exciting field to work in than technology for social good. And I think that a lot of the people who are, you know, at this conference feel the same way. And I hope they join with us, Okta and other companies, the nonprofit sector, to see, to make sure that tech really matters for all of humanity. Wonderful. I think that is a great place to wrap up this session. Uh, and I know that this conversation will, will continue throughout our extended social impact community and the good work will continue, obviously, uh, between our two organizations. So, Jim, I want to just thank you so, so much for sharing your experience, your inspiration with us. Um, partners like you truly do make our work better. And I'm just so grateful to be able to collaborate with you and excited for what we're going to do. Thanks. And I invite all of you 
to join these other sessions listed here that were specifically designed for our nonprofit and social impact community. If you're tuning in live today, then you can attend all of these sessions back to back starting at 1 p.m. Pacific. You can also watch them on demand anytime after their scheduled air times. And I just want to end by thanking all of you for attending Octane 20 Live and attending this session. Be well, stay safe, and have a great day. Thanks.